So now let's think about risk premiums. Risk premiums are really the heart of finance. Let's start by looking at our basic price is expected discounted payoff formula. And I want to break this up, one of the central tricks. I'm going to break E of mx up using the definition of covariance. This is just the definition of covariance is E of mx minus E m e x. So I can turn that around and break it up this way. We know what E of m is. That's just the risk-free rate. <coughs> so now we've broken up the price into two components. The first, E of x of rf, and the second, covariance of m and x. This is a beautiful formula. E of x over rf is just the standard discounted cash flow formula. Take the expected payment, discount it by the risk-free rate. Wait, you say, that's wrong because it doesn't include corrections for risk. That's exactly right. We now have broken it down into the time element captured by interest rates and the risk element, which is generated by the covariance of the discount factor with the payoff. The covariance is what determines the risk premium. That's the central lesson here. Let's express that in terms of rate of returns, which is more traditional in the finance and in the empirical literature that we want to connect to. So we can break up any return into the risk-free rate and then the return minus the risk-free rate, or the risk-free rate plus the excess return. And again, the risk-free rate captures the time element, and the excess return, which is a zero-cost portfolio, captures the risk element. So starting with our basic equation for uh, pricing an excess return, let's break it up uh, similarly into the product and the covariances. That's just E of excess return over risk-free rate plus the covariance. And now turn it around, put the expected return on the left. That's the tradition in finance. Let's, instead of trying to understand prices, let's understand expected returns. It's the same idea, of course. A, a low price, if that's time and that's price, a low price is the same as a high expected return. So it's the same idea. So what do we learn? Expected returns are equal to the covariance of the discount factor with the returns. Or the original return is the risk-free rate plus uh, the covariance of the discount factor with returns. We're almost ready to do what we just did with interest rates. We're almost ready to plug in M for consumption growth and start learning about the macroeconomic determinants of risk premiums. Where do they really come from? Why do some securities pay higher average returns than others? That was the exciting question we started the whole class with. But if we plug M in here, again, we've got this thing with the nonlinear consumption growth to some power, and then we start doing approximations. Perhaps, again, by going to continuous time, the continuous time limit will be linear and simple for us. And that's exactly uh, the way it is. So we've learned that covariance drives the risk premium, not the variance of the return. Uh, the low price is what generates a high expected return. So these two ideas are similar. And risk premiums are really important. Uh, if we look at just the stock market in general, the stock market's average return is about 8% of which 2% is risk-free rate and about 6% is risk premium. So the risk premium is central to understanding stock market returns and everything in economics and finance. OK, two continuous time. How do we do that? Let's go back to we had our continuous time formula, E of d lambda v. We broke that out into by Ito's lemma, d lambda dv and the cross product. And now we know what to do with each of these three terms. E of d lambda over lambda is the risk-free rate term. E of dv over v is the expected return. That's the, so, that's the kind of object we're looking for. That's good. And now we have that term, which is the covariance of discount factor growth with return. So let's plug this thing out on the left-hand side. Expected return is risk-free rate minus covariance of discount factor growth with return. That is, a, now you can see an equation that is transparently in continuous time exactly the same form as the one in discrete time. Uh, e of d lambda v didn't look a lot like 1 equals e of mr, but expected return is risk-free rate plus covariance uh, with, with discount factor. That is a clear expression in continuous time of the same discrete time idea. And fortunately, we lose that RF in front, which was kind of annoying in the discrete time case. So now we're ready. What have we done? We've thought about risk premiums expressed as expected returns. 
uh, in continuous time and discrete time. And now we're ready to put consumption in and start thinking about the, the, the macroeconomic determinants. Where do risk premiums really come from? So we've got expected excess return is risk-free rate plus, and now d lambda over lambda was just the only term that remains is the Ito term. The only term that remains is the one where the shock to consumption growth hits the shock to return. So all that remains is expected return is risk-free rate uh, plus covariance of consumption growth with return multiplied by the risk aversion coefficient. Or the discrete time approximation we were looking for, expected return is risk-free rate plus covariance of consumption growth with return multiplied by risk aversion coefficient. This is just a beautiful formula and the heart of all of finance. What do we learn? First, the ingredient. Investors care about consumption. They don't care about the return of the securities. They don't care about the portfolio return. They don't care about the stocks they hold. They care about consumption. So why is it that covariance rather than variance of return is what drives the risk premium? Because the covariance of a return with consumption growth tells you uh, how much does buying a little bit more of that asset affect the volatility of your consumption growth. And that's what you really care about. You don't care about the asset per se, you care about the consumption growth. If you were asked, do you want a steak? We have to ask in the context of what overall dinner? That's what's going on here. If you're asked, do you want some of this return in the context of what does it do to your overall consumption growth? As an example, a good example, you might well buy uh, securities with terrible expected returns. You are. If you have car insurance, you have a security with a terrible expected return. Why do you hold a security with terrible expected return? You're paying them more than they pay you. Because they pay you on days when your car just got stolen. They pay out very well. Their payment is very good. It's negatively correlated with consumption growth. They pay well on a day when your consumption is terrible because your car just got stolen. Conversely, most securities pay well when you're already doing well, and that's why you require a high risk premium to be forced to hold it. Let me show you just a simple example to drive home why covariance matters. Consider two securities. The security has payoff X or, or excess return, if you'd like. X or RE doesn't matter which we, which we call here, which is either plus one or minus one and the probability is a half of plus one or minus one. Well, there's security A and here's security B. They both have, thou has plus one and minus one, this has minus one and plus one. Do you care which one you own? From what I've told you now, they look identical, right? Who cares uh, which state the plus and minus one is? But now let's suppose that this security is in a state where consumption is good and that's consumption is bad. Whereas this again is consumption is good and that's consumption is bad. Now compare the two securities. This one gives you more money when you're already feeling great and takes money away when you're feeling terrible. This one gives you money when you're feeling terrible and takes money away when you're feeling great. This is a much better security for you to buy. That means, however, you will drive its price up and, and you will drive its expected return down. So the expected return will be low on this security because of its covariance with consumption growth having nothing to do with its variance or other properties.